Pastor Boyles, and I'm the chaplain at the Ajax Turner Senior Activity Center, where every Wednesday we get together for a Bible study from 9.45 to 10.45 a.m. When you can't attend, we'd like to bring that message home to you. So today we're going to be looking at 2 Kings 12, 4 through 16, and that will give you an opportunity to follow along there at home when you can't be with us live here on YouTube. We'd sure like for you to like and subscribe so you'll receive further notifications of any other videos that we may have for you. Well, as a way of providing some information leading up to our, our scripture for today, there's a lot in the background text that's covered in 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 1, all the way through 16, verse 20. I want to get us caught up, at least at this particular point, through chapter 11, leading up to chapter 12, verse 4. You see, 2 Kings provides the details of one of the strangest occurrences that you'll read about that took place between the kings of Israel and Judah. If you remember, Jehu had been anointed through the arrangement of Elisha. And that also had led to the death of two wicked kings of both nations, Joram to the king of Israel in the north, and then Ahaziah was the king of Judah in the south. Now, Jay also, also oversaw the death of Jezebel and the 70 sons of Ahab, and the destruction as well of the priests of Baal and its temple. And with both kings dead, Jehu had remained in Israel, and this had created a vacuum of leadership, if you will, in the south. As a result, the queen mother in Judah, Athaliah, proceeded to destroy all the sons of the Davidic line of Judah. Well, at least she thought she had. It was her desire, and it had consumed her. But nevertheless, God had a plan in place, and she was not successful. You see, Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram that we read, managed to hide her infant brother Jehosh for seven years. And it's during those seven years that Joash remained hidden that he was raised up and trained by a godly priest we know as Jehoiada. It was at the end of those seven years that Jehoiada revealed the truth about who Jehoash was, that he was the true king in the Davidic line. And he did so to the captain of the army, who subsequently led a coup that was successful, and Athaliah was assassinated and the boy Jehosh was crowned king. And throughout the lifetime of the priest of Jehoiada, Joash was a godly king. However, we learned in 2 Kings, or 2 Chronicles, pardon me, chapter 24 of Jehoiada's death. And it was upon his death that ungodly leaders of Judah would influence Joash and convince him to abandon the temple and to promote idolatry. In Judah. Zechariah, Jehoiada's son, became a prophet and rebuked Joash for his idolatry. Joash ordered Zechariah to be stoned to death, and it was after the Aramean army invaded Jerusalem that Joash was severely wounded. And it was while he was weak that his officials conspired against him, and they killed him. Scripture also tells us that he was not buried amongst the tombs of the kings of Israel and Judah. Well, by now you've probably found our lesson for today in chapter 12, verse 4 through 16. And so you hold your finger on that for a moment, and we're going to get to that, and we're going to open it up into God's word for us today. But before we open that up and, and begin our walk through that, I want to take time for us to go to the Lord in prayer. So would you bow your heads with me? Precious and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day that you've given us. We rejoice and are glad in it. Heavenly Father, we ask that we might be forgiven for where we have sinned against you, either by thought, word, or deed, against thy divine majesty. Lord, as we come into your presence, we give you all praise and glory. And Heavenly Father, I ask that you might 
Attune our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to thine own. Teach us what you would have us learn through your powerful Holy Spirit that we may be able not only to learn from what you teach us today, but to take what we've learned and to put it into practice. And so, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock, our strength, and our Redeemer. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Our God is an awesome God, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to share God's word with you today. I also would like to hear from you as well. So if upon listening to this video, you have questions or anything, make sure that you provide those in the comments there below. Hit the bell on the left bottom and like us and uh, subscribe to us. Actually, it's a hand that goes with the likes up. And then it's the bell to subscribe so that you can receive further notification of any other videos that we may have available. Well, today we're going to see our God honors. And have you ever been honored to watch over or be responsible for something special? You know, it could be a keepsake. Honors being bestowed on us is awesome. Seeing them taken away can be very sad. So. Today's lesson is going to give us an opportunity to see what happens when an honor is taken away, but how God can work in the way that he does to, to reveal to us things that we need to learn. Like even every young person can be taught godly ways and godly decision making. But we also know that we must be diligent and accountable towards the proper use of God's property. And third, that our work for the Lord must be appropriately used as designated. Like when I spoke of earlier, and an honor being taken away. It, if we don't do what we are expected to do, and we have to know how to handle it, should we lose that honor? Now, in our lesson today, we, we've already learned about the evil at the lion. As she became queen, and the baby king, Joash was rescued. That took place all in chapter 11. And we learned at the beginning in verses 1 through 3 that Joash was seven years old. Johada secured the help of the army officers to destroy Athaliah and make Joash king. That took place in those first three verses of chapter 12, leading up to where we are today. In this first section, in verses 4 through 8, we're going to see a problem that exists. So once you open up your text, let's, let's walk through this together. Follow along with me in whatever version of the Bible that you are reading for. Then Joshua said to the priests, All the money of the sacred things which is brought into the house of the Lord in current money, both the money of each man's assessment and all the money which any man's heart prompts him to bring. To bring into the house of the Lord. Now the Bible uses two different names for the King Joash. One is King Joash, J-O-A-S-H. The other, Joash, G-E, or J-E-H-O-A-S-H. For example, in 2 Kings, it refers to him as Joash, J-O-A-S-H, and in 11, 2, and 12, 19. But he's also called Jehosh in 11, 4 through 18. So you can see that with, along with what we're going to learn now too, is that it's easy to get confused when you're reading a name that changes subsequently in scripture. And then to add on top of it, there is another Jehosh who was a king later in the reign of Israel. But that's different from about whom we're referring to and talking about today. Now, even as a very young man, Josh was dedicated to the Lord. And we learned that he was raised by the godly priest, Jehoiada. And we learned that he wanted the temple to be repaired. The money of each man's assessment 
Now, what is that? Most likely, this is money that is collected through a census. We read about that in Exodus 30, verses 11 to 16. It is required by law. But then there is the money, which is any man heart prompts. This is a voluntary offering. Now in verse 5, if you've got your scripture there, you've put, kept your finger on it, we're going to read what it has to say there. It says, let the priests take it for themselves, each from his acquaintance, and they shall repair the damages of the house wherever any damage may be found. You see, at this particular point, what we're learning is that the money collected was handled by the priestly acquaintances. Uh, probably a better way of looking at that is treasurers. And they would collect the money, the priests would collect the money for their own living. But they were also to see that the temple was repaired. And it can be argued that what were these repairs that were taking place about the temple? Well, first of all, we, we know Athaliah was an evil queen and she was destroying everything. And much of it could be attributed to the reign of Athaliah, of the damages that had happened to the temple. And because uh, King Jehosh is so young, and as we said, the 23rd year, it, it came about the 23rd year of the king of Joash, the priest had not repaired the damages of the house. This is what we read in verse 6. So this is the 23rd year of his reign. He, he's about up to 30. And, and no repairs to the temple had been made. You know, when you give your children something to do and you come home and you find out they didn't do it, there's, there's repercussions, there's consequences. And the priests were apparently unwilling to take from their own to make the repairs of the temple. And that brings us to verse 7. You've got your Bibles open there. And let's, let's read what it has to say there in verse 7. Then King Joash called for Jehoiada, the priest, and the other priests. And he said to them, Why did you not repair the damages of the house? Now, therefore, take no more money from your acquaintances, but pay it for the damages of the house. <laughs> it's easy to see now that there is no doubt that Joash was disturbed because no money had ever been appropriated for the temple repair. Having served in resource management as well, part of my life. I know what happens when money that's been allocated and allotted for certain things is not used as it should be or has been appropriated. In this case, because it had not been appropriated for temple repair, he insisted that the use of the acquaintances should be eliminated. <clears throat> this took out the middlemen or the treasurers over the collection, and it would have to be done in a different way. So we get to verse 8. Here we read, So the priests agreed that they would take no money from the people, no repair the damages of the house. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What do you mean, nor repair the damages of the house? I thought that was the problem. They, none of the repairs were being done. Perhaps... It's better explained if you have a copy of the NIV there, is they would not repair the temple themselves. You see, that part was going to be taken away from them. Joash was insisting that the priests were no longer the decision makers. It would not really be deciding on what or what not should get repaired. That decision was going to be taken away and given to someone else entirely. They no longer had the honor of the oversight of the temple repair because it was not getting done. So what's the solution? We're going to find that in the next three verses, 9 through 12. And if you're still with me, let's open up verse 9 and see what it has to say. But Jehoah the priest took a chest and bored a hole in its lid. And he put it beside the altar on the right side as, as one came into the house of the Lord. I believe it says one comes into the house of the Lord. 
And the priests who guarded the threshold put it all the money which was brought into the house of the Lord. Now we're saying that there are two types of money here. I hope you're following along with me. Money which was collected from the vows and from the census. And this was going to continue to be used for temple services. But then there was the, the second type, the voluntary offerings. And they would be placed in a chest as people would drop in donations. They would do that when they came into the worship of the house of the Lord. You know, Psalm 122, 1 that we read, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And overjoyed as they come into the house of the Lord because the money that they are using now is going directly into the beautification. And so apparently when the people saw that the money was going to be used only for temper restoration, they gave even more generously. Now let's go to verse 10. If you've got your scriptures there. And here's what it says. When they saw that there was much money in the chest, the king's scribe and the high priest came up and tied it in bags, counted the money, which was found in the house of the Lord. These are the royal secretaries. And they would be present there to, to see that the money was counted. And we, we follow those practices today in the church, two or three people watching how the money is counted to make sure that it's all there, the dollars, the quarters, the 50 cent pieces, the checks. Today, it's a practice of providing accountability that was in place here, and we do it today. It says in verse 11, they gave the money which was weighed out into the hands of those who did the work, who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they paid it out to the carpenters and the builders who worked on the house of the Lord. This was the wish of Joash, that the money collected from the chest was weighted out and then distributed right directly to the persons responsible for doing the repairs of the work. Now today we can find some fault with, with that practice, but what it shows here is that when people are honorable, they do the things that they're supposed to do, that they're tasked to do. And in repairing the temple, the carpenters and the builders were paid for the work that they did without question. And it was evident in the repairs that took place. Verse 12 says, and the masons and the stonecutters, and for buying timber and home stone to repair the damages to the house of the Lord, and for all that was laid out for the house to repair it. The money was used to pay those who carved and dressed the stone. It was paid for the lumber and, those, uh, and the honing of the stones, all used to make repairs. The money was no longer under the oversight of the priest, but to the people that knew the work that needed to be done, what needed to be done, and when it needed to be done. And because it was being done as it was, money was not a question, it was continuing to be given. And in verse 13 it says, but there were not made for the house of the Lord silver cups, snuffer bowls, trumpets, any vessels of gold or vessels of silver from the money which was brought into the house of the Lord. What is that, Pastor? What is that? Well, you have to remember people brought in objects that were internally then melted down and used for temple items, such as snuffers, which if you've gone into a church where they have a lot of candles and you see them and, and, and they reach over and they put out the candles, these are, these are snuffers, sacred metal objects used to put over the flames and embers around open fire. Sometimes silver shekels would be melted and molded into various objects. And, if, and I know that, it, you know, that was something that people often did when they, when they invaded uh, the monasteries in, in England and around the world to, to gather up all, all of that and those collections in the chest. However, the money collected in the chest was never used for such a purpose, 
but only for the repair of the temple. How amazing is that? Then in verse 14, for they gave that to those who did the work, and with it they repaired the house of the Lord. So again, the house, the money that was for this purpose was directly given to those who planned and executed the work on the temple. And it took place and they were lavish and it was done, but it wasn't greed or anything from, from the priest. It was strictly the people giving for what they wanted to see a very beautiful temple or to, to see a very beautiful place to come and worship. Verse 15 says, Moreover, they did not require any accounting from the men into whose hands they gave the money to pay those who did the work, for they dealt faithfully. Underline faithfully. You see, this is the responsibility we have as believers. That when we have been given the honor of doing something for the Lord, we do it and we do it faithfully. Not undercutting it, not doing it uh, uh, and trying to find shortcuts. The priest did not assess or evaluate the way in which the workers used or spent the money. Because all who watched the temple repair did that amongst themselves. They could see that the money was being used wisely for its construction. Once again, underlined faithfully. For the workers dealt faithfully as they worked on the house of the Lord. Now we get to our last verse in our lesson today, verse 16. And here it reads, the money from the guilt offerings and the money from the sin offerings was not brought into the house of the Lord. No. It was for the priests. This is the law of Moses. This stipulated that, that the money that was collected from the guilt offerings and, and from the sin offerings was to be given to the priest. This is outlined in Numbers chapter 5, verses 7 through 10, if you want to go look there. And therefore, the collection of the money to support the livelihood of the priest was dependent on this. And therefore, the temple service continued. God already was able to, to do what he needed to do. And this brings us to the conclusion of our, our lesson today that God honors. God honors your giving. God honors your faithfulness. God honors your willingness to do all that he asks of you to do. I want to encourage you to go ahead and read the remaining background text chapter, 2 Kings chapter 12, the remaining verses 17 through 21. Joash paid Hazel to fend off a conquest. He was murdered in a conspiracy. Second Kings chapter 13. Listen, you've got to read this. Josh, and then Josh succeeded as king of Israel. And Elisha dies. But there's a fascinating description that takes place in the account of the death of Elisha. After Elisha died and was buried, Moabite raiders came through the land at the same time another man was being buried. And what transpired was that those making the burial quickly threw the body into Elisha's tomb. You know what happened? When the body of the dead man touched the bones of Elisha, he came alive. The body came back alive. 2 Kings 14, Amaziah reigns in Judah and Jeroboam in Israel, Jeroboam II. Second. second Kings 15, Azariah Uzziah reigns in Judah and Zechariah, then Shalom reign in Israel. Second Kings 16, Ahaz begins to reign in Judah and builds a different altar like he saw in Damascus. We learn of one of the greatest onslaughts of Judah ever faced in chapter 16. It became known as the Syro-Ephraimite crisis. 
the nation of Assyria had made vassal states of both Aram and Israel. Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, king of Israel, decided that, well, they decided to join forces to resist Assyria. Consequently, they demanded that Judah join the coalition. Here's what happens. King Ahaz of Judah refuses to do so. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to join with you. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles chapter 28. I encourage you to do that. It describes the destruction, listen to this, of 120,000 soldiers of Judah. The losses are incredible. But they never conquered Jerusalem. In the meantime, King Ahaz sent silver and gold to hire Assyria for help. And Tiglath Pilzer killed Rezin and Pekah, and Judah became a vassal state of Assyria. Well, that concludes everything that we were able to get through in our lesson today. And in our lesson next week, we're going to learn that God judges. That'll be found in 2 Kings 17, verses 7 through 20, if you want to be reading ahead. But thanks for joining us here today for our lesson. Hope you will make this a regular part of your worship during the week. And again, if you can join us on Wednesdays, 945 to 1045 a.m. at 953 Clark Street in Clarksville, Tennessee, we'd love to have you there too. May God bless and have a great day.